I certainly feel like I know more now about the two watersheds and the three organizations than I did an hour ago. So thank you. That's really good. Um, I, what struck me as I listened to the work of these organizations is uh, these are just three more examples of kind of how Northwest Arkansas does it. We've got challenges and we've got issues. And a lot of the issues are growth related. You know, the stresses on the watershed, the changing dynamics in, in the different watershed. That's because our population is growing. That's a lot because the economy is good and people want to be here. But uh, there, there are stresses and issues that, that we need to, to deal with. And what I love is each of these three organizations came together, in, in most cases, proactively uh, to deal with these issues before they became major problems. And so thank you all for that and your work there. It's very encouraging. And I travel around and I tell people that's how Northwest Arkansas does it on so many issues. Um, we've got 11 minutes left for the call <laughs> time of the, the forum, uh, and I'm sure there are questions. As great as the presentations were, I know you've got things that are on your mind or that you're curious about. So any volunteers to be first? All right. Thank you. Hi. I felt like you got cut off a little bit um, in talking about the Cage Springs water, uh, the new education center. Hi, thank you. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. I'm sorry, did y'all hear me? <laughs> sure, I would be really happy to. This is an opportunity um, that came about. The Cage Springs, I mean, you know, is about four miles west of um, the Lowell exit off the highway I-540. 10,000 cars go by this little property every day, mostly through uh, XNA Airport. But at the back of it, it's a 30-acre property that we were able to acquire with a grant from the Walton Family Foundation and a number of our corporations and, and some really generous donors, including the Hale, helped us buy that um, property and put it into conservation. So what we'll be able to do with that is to use it as a watershed education center uh, because it is such an example of our region and our watershed. Underground water coming out of the cave system, karst uh, topography, into a reservoir out to the outfall that goes directly into Osage Creek that, that joins up with Spring Creek that eventually goes to the Illinois River and on into Oklahoma. So it's really a great center location here in the urban areas of how unique our watershed is and we're just excited that that property is now, it has always been in private uh, hands, it's now in conservation and, and it's owned by the partnership and we'll be able to partner with other groups to do education there at the center. <coughs> Thank you. Good, good question. Thank you. What else? Uh, by the way, I expect this to be really boring, and it hasn't been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one, um, how, how do lakes here uh, compare to other lakes in terms of being clean? And secondly, um, ha and I guess this is for Dr. Hager, um, have you noticed any effects of climate change, especially on Beer Lake? You know, we've had these wild variations of weather, we've had droughts, et cetera. I'll answer the second one first, uh, just because that's what's on my mind, is the effects of climate change on Beaver Lake. Well, the obvious effects that everyone sees is a change in water depth. And we've gone from seeing some of the lowest water depths not too long ago to, you know, the lake's full again. And, and that's one of the things with climate change that we have to deal with is, is it's, it's not necessary, I wouldn't think of it in terms of uh, things changing one way or the other, it's the extremes on both ends that we may more frequently see. It. And so it's managing your watershed and looking at either lake, uh, those are some important issues. And the big concern with that is how could that potentially influence algal growth in the reservoir and, uh, and how does that translate into uh, the quality of our drinking water? And uh, we actually have uh, Dr. Thad Scott and Dr. Byron Winston at the University of Arkansas who are working on some projects who are looking at how increases in carbon uh, dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, how, how that coupled with increases in nutrient transport into reservoirs, how that can impact things. And so I think those, those questions we don't have answers yet, but those are 
across the, the waterworks in industry, those are some very important questions that there's a lot of good researchers working on right now. Now, the, regarding the quality of the lakes that we have, I, I, think, I think we're very fortunate. I mean, Beaver Lake's a huge reservoir, and, and it has some obvious changes in water quality as you move from the headwaters, where all the big creeks flow in, downstream near the dam. Anyone who's been on Beaver Lake, if you want, if you want clear water, you got to get past the, where War Eagle Creek and the White River Arms of Beaver Lake come together at Hickory Creek and, and go downstream from there. And the further downstream and closer to the dam you get, you know, the, the, the further down in the water you can see. And, you know, one benefit that the state of Missouri has is Beaver Lake's the first lake in the chain of White River Lakes. And so <laughs> we retain a lot of nutrients in Beaver Lake and they don't make it to, they don't make it to Table Rock. And then Table Rock retains a lot of nutrients, and, and those nutrients don't make it to Bull Shows. And so it's a really unique thing that the uh, that Congress did establishing these reservoirs on the White River. And uh, and I would say overall, I mean, the, the quality of our reservoirs is is, is, is really high. And, and and that's what we want to protect and preserve. Is we want to keep it at status quo, and, and see some moderate improvements as opposed to uh, you know really focused on having to see improvements in water quality. We, we want to, I mean, in my opinion, we want to kind of keep things the way they are with just slight improvements. All right. More questions? All right. I'd like to ask you a couple of things. One, is there any program or movement towards trying to secure the land closest to Beaver Lake or sometimes some of the streams and, and rivers specifically to put in public uh, ownership for watershed protection. And the other question I have is about the karst um, under us. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has a terrific map on the karst um, in this area and especially to the west of Fayetteville. And as we grow and things are built on top of that cars, like highways and stuff, I'd like to know if any of y'all are uh, have been asked or are taking part in studying what development on top of that cars would mean to our water. I'll answer the first part of your question about the uh, land preservation around the lake, the lakeside subwatershed is a, a high priority for us because if anything does happen, it, it's in the lake really quick. Uh, do we have a specific program for that area at this time? No, uh, we don't, but we, we have a general land uh, conservation goal. And so one of our in, you know priorities is to work with the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust to, to help those types of things happen. And of course, the Nature Conservancy last year with the Devil's Eye Trail area being put into an easement, you know, it's, that's wonderful for around the lake. Um, we are a little bit fortunate that the Corps of Engineers has some of that property and that they can manage it a little bit, uh, but there's no doubt we really need to have a high focus around the lakeside area. And, uh, Billy, do you want to talk about the cars in, in the western portion of our county? Uh, yeah, I, I, regarding the cars, I mean that that's that's something that you know that makes this area very unique, and uh, I haven't had that much experience in dealing with it. Uh, you know, I, I focus more on the streams to kind of integrate all the cars topography and the groundwater recharge into the streams, and so we monitor and see how things change there. Is the Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning Commission has just hired? Or they, they released a request for qualifications for someone to to organize all the data related to cars in Northwest Arkansas. We'll put him on the spot. But I see Paul Justice here, who works for Regional Planning Commission. If, if you want to come in on that, oh, I, I think the Select Committee did. Uh, the Select Committee did choose an engineering firm, a local one. The details have not been worked out, but it's got to be helpful. So I guess the answer would be if someone is going to be looking at how the potential development in this area is going to influence the cars, and I think one of the charges that they never request for qualification was how to establish a baseline so we can know how things are changing. 
Really great questions. I, I think we have time for maybe one more. Is that okay? All right. Paul, we asked you a question, so you get to ask me. <laughs> well, anybody knows me. I go on my vacation to a economics conference and public finance. <laughs> So the question is, uh, we've got a vacation. You went on your vacation there, <laughs> um, and, and they have this particular ideology that things like natural resources, like water and the sky, are public commons. But anyway, we the, the question is, we've got this population growth coming. We know it's been here for many years, and it's been very, fairly rapid. So, but the, the supply of water is limited, so we've got rising demand and limited supply. So the question is, how do we pay for this water and then all the services that you were doing? And, and I know that it's sort of piecemeal with federal dollars here and, and lots of generous donations from our corporations, that's great. But uh, are we paying enough for our water? And uh, uh, that's just kind of a philosophical question. Uh, should we be paying more? You want to let the moderator answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we, we, do, we do have an individual in the room that would like to answer the question. Uh, Angela looks, looks ready as well, so let's, let's hear from a participant for a minute, and, let's, and I'd like to hear what Angela has to say. Um, I think that your question about are we paying enough for our water and, and the broader question of water quantity is one that's going to be confronting the population, you know, on local scale and, and even regional scale. Um, there, this generally the southeast is considered to be water rich, but um, right now, for example, in Georgia, there's a huge fight going on over water, and is Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, for example, going to have enough water? Um, and how do we? protect our water and keep it from getting polluted? How do we protect our water and keep it from running off? Um, and so all of those things cost money. All of these programs that we mentioned here, they all cost money. And in the end, it's cheaper. It's far cheaper by orders of magnitude to do conservation, preservation, than to have to go back and do restoration or to have to go back and figure out um, how do we make water go further and, and meet more needs um, than we had originally planned for. And, you know, right now in Arkansas, we're currently revising the Arkansas Water Plan, and that plan deals very much with water quantity issues for now out through the next 50 years and um, looks throughout all of the state from um, the uh, eastern part of Arkansas that uses a lot of groundwater and agricultural uses. Um, to here for population growth. Um, so are we paying enough for water? Um, probably not. Probably it may get more expensive as we need um, to meet increased standards to just maintain water quality because if you have to clean up dirty water, it's also really expensive. Just to clean up dirty water and get it distributed to a population for drinking water is very expensive. So it's far cheaper for us to do preservation and conservation. Um, I, want, I wanted to also answer that question too, uh, or try to. The uh, Beaver Watershed Protection Plan uh, did anticipate and did make a statement that we should be looking, the Beaver Watershed Alliance should be looking for a sustainable source of funding. And what they had in mind and what a number of our board members have, have in mind, and this has actually been discussed with some of the board members of the various water suppliers, is because Beaver Lake is a source of water for these four companies that provide all of Northwest Arkansas, at some point in the future, the Beaver Watershed Alliance intends to ask these four companies to put a one or two cent per thousand gallon charge on the water, and that money will become the sustainable source of funding for the Beaver Watershed Alliance. Uh, one cent per thousand gallon today, with the usage that they have today, is about $300,000 a year, is what that would generate. Like I said, we have uh, discussed that with some of the board members um, on the three largest uh, water suppliers. 
Uh, none of them have said hell no, uh, which is a good sign. And what we're actually waiting for now is to get to the point in the Beaver Watershed Alliance programs that we can make a case that from a source water protection point of view, we are a cost-effective investment for their customers. Um, the work we are doing will help them avoid future investment in water cleanup. And when we can get to that point that we can make that case, then we will go forward and ask for one or two cents. Thank you, Bob. Right. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that. I think one of the interesting things you see, and I've seen this in uh, water works related conferences that I've gone to nationally, is that the people that are selling water, Beaver Water District 2, um, they're out promoting conservation efforts. So they're essentially trying to reduce their income to get people to use less water. And, and you kind of think from an economics perspective, why? Well, what they're looking at is the 2050 needs and beyond. And they know that to be able to meet that, that the, one of the easiest ways is to reduce consumption. And so I think you'll, you'll see, we've been fortunate here to be water rich, but you'll see as time goes on, more and more of a push into, you know, you know things like, you know, waterless urinals that were installed in Beaver Water District, and just things like that that can, can save a gallon here and a, gallon, a liter here and a liter there. You'll see more and more of that become prevalent in Northwest Arkansas. And that's what that's one of the key things that's going to help us meet our water needs for my kids' generation and the next. Great. Okay, we're over time. <laughs> you did a great uh, job. We got a lot of thank yous. First, thank you on behalf of all the panelists. Thank you to the league for bringing attention to this issue, convening a community discussion. It really was a community discussion because we got great input and questions from everyone here. Uh, thanks to the folks in the room that volunteer. Uh, to take action in your own life, in, in your, on your own property, uh, at your own homes. And there are a lot of examples here tonight. I can't see everybody, but Aubrey does so much. Bob's the founding chair of the Beaver Watershed Alliance, so uh, thank him for that. And Karen, your rain garden and everything else you do, and so many others. I apologize for leaving them out. And then a big thank you to all the panelists who uh, get up each day and work hard on these issues on all our behalf and uh, we're doing such a great job with it. So please join me in thank you. Well, thanks, Mike, and thank you, panelists. This has been a fantastic evening. I love our audience. I hope you will stay and have a chat with them, finish up the food, and let's go out and conserve water. Thank you. Thank you.